this is a recording of a previous masterclass that I ran. You can download the sample data set using the video description. Let's go. In today's session, what we are going to do is we are going to look at a Melbourne housing data set. This is a data set that I downloaded from Kaggle. Kaggle is a open data community where people share data sets, collaborate with each other on doing data analysis, data science, data engineering related stuff and all of that. So I downloaded this particular data set from Kaggle. The original data set had uh, quite a lot more data and I didn't want the data to overwhelm us. Like if you are working in an example demo, 300,000 rows of data, then occasionally a lot of time will be spent just looking at the data. So I didn't want that to happen. So what I did is I took that data and then I randomly sampled uh, about 3000 odd rows of data into my workbook. So it's the same data set, just a sample pulled out and some columns that I thought are not too relevant, I took them out. Uh, but I put a link to the original data set in the example file. The file can be downloaded if you go back to my invitation email, in all the emails I have put the link to that file. So go and download it if you want to follow along. So we are going to look at that. We are going to do analysis along five themes. The themes are also announced in that book workbook. So if you look at that, you can see that. Uh, and we are going to do that. So let's go. So there's this is the workbook um, sample Melbourne house listing data. The source is here in the link if you want to get the full data set which i highly recommend for practice purposes go and grab it from kaggle you can use this data set with excel with power bi with python or whatever else you're learning really because it has got a sufficient variation in the data so here is the data the sample data set 3000 rows uh, random sample pulled out of the main thing we're going to do these five things hopefully I'm saying hopefully because my aim is to talk, uh, try to do this for 60 minutes from now about now. We'll see how far we'll go. Hopefully we'll cover all these five with sufficient detail. Uh, but if we can't get all the way through, that is fine. As long as you're learning something and I'm, I'm able to explain those goals are met. So our first step is to do a little bit of quick data exploration and quick analysis. Imagine you are just like a, a space traveler and you now traveled and landed on this data set in a foreign planet or an alien planet. So the first thing that you would do is you'd step out, take a look around. That's re literally what we are, what we are gonna do. Uh, traditionally, this kind of thing is also called as EDA, exploratory data analysis. So we are gonna do that. Generally, whenever you are working with the data inside Excel, the way to exploratory explore the data best and fastest is two options. One is if the data is not yet in Excel, it is somewhere in a text file or on a web page and you're bringing it there. Uh, then the best best starting point is to bring the data into Power Query. Because Power Query will let you not only load the data, but also it can let you quickly scan the data to see what is there and maybe do some of the other things that you you want to try. Power Query is the number one option. Uh, and the second way to do this is, if the data is already in Excel, which is the case for us, um, then you can do, before you, you do anything, like any, like visually scan the data, is to set up a table. So because the data is already here, we are not going to get into the Power Query world of things, but that would be the better option. In fact, I would do that nine times out of 10 uh, every time I'm working with data. So what we are going to do is first up, we are going to select this entire data. Uh, you can select entire data set using either control shift arrow keys, or if the data is continuous like this, you can place your cursor cell anywhere and then press either control A, A for all, or control star. And then it's asterisk symbol, control shift eight or control star. One of these shortcuts will select all the data. Once you're able to select everything, if you press control T, T for table, you will insert a table. 
In fact, you don't even need to select all of the data. You can just select any one cell and press Control T. Excel is smart enough to pick things up. But if you have got like very large set of data, you want to double check that the range here uh, is is actually corresponding to your data. So B6 to P3006, that looks all right to me. And if there is a header row, make sure that you have enabled that. So in my case, I have got header. I'm going to enable that. Generally, when you're presented with some data set, either your boss or your client or your customer sends you, hey, look at all of this data and you know analyze. The first curious thing that I would do is read the column names and kind of come to a sense of what is what. Normally, in about seven or eight times out of 10, you would also start with an intuition of what is what. But if you don't have any intuition, you don't know what this data is all about, you will need to spend a little bit more time outside Excel talking to the right people before you can come to some conclusions about this data. This data is from Kaggle, so I would go to the Kaggle page, read a little bit more to understand what is there. I'm going to quickly explain what, what we have here. We have got a suburb, uh, the actual address of the property, type of the property. So there is three values. I haven't read the full document yet, but I am assuming H is for house, T is for townhouse, and U is for unit. So um, unit is like an apartment, uh, townhouse is like a small house that is just attached to another house, and a house is like an ind independent house. <laughs> The price would be in Australian dollars. Uh, that's uh, that. One of the thing, cool things that tables do is when you set up a table, they'll automatically set the filter so you can quickly kind of see what is there. And method seems to be the method of sales, like how it is sold. And I have no idea about the Australian rules, so I'm, I don't know what these are, but there are five methods of sale. And seller G is the person or the agency that sold that particular house. And we have got uh, the date on which that particular sale happened, how far the property is from the CBD of Melbourne uh, and the postcode, how many bedrooms are there, how many bathrooms are there, how many car parks are there, what is the size of the land? Again, I'm assuming this is in meter square. Um, and then what is the lat and long of that property? Uh, now, the first thing that we want to do is do a little bit of exploration, understand what is what. We already kind of got some of it by using the table and filter. So, for example, if I want to know what types of houses are there, I can see this, how many suburbs are there. I can kind of see this and come to some conclusions. But let's just say you want to count how many suburbs are there. Just how many different suburbs are there in the sample data. You can use either formulas or pivot tables to answer these kind of things. Uh, we're going to try some options. For example, how many suburbs are there? Uh, but before that, I'm just going to insert a few more rows on the top um, so that we have some space to play around with this. And this data is in a table format. Whenever you make a table, uh, it's a good idea to check the table design ribbon and look for the name of the table. So it will be called table one unless you name it properly. If you have been making multiple tables in that file, then it might be called table 73 or whatever. So pick this and you can actually type a name here. So I'm going to type this as Melbourne, short for Melbourne. Uh, so give your table a name. This way, whenever you read to refer to that table, you will refer to by Melb rather than table one or table seven. You don't need to remember the numbers or names. You can remember the word, which is a lot better. Uh, and then here, what we are going to do is for the exploration part, we are going to do some quick kind of checks on the data. So first of all, how many houses are there? Total houses. How many houses? And this is basically each address is one house, so we can count how many addresses are there. So you can say count uh, Melb address. But count is only going to count the numbers in the data, so it's not going to count text values. Address is typically a text value. So what you really need to use is count A function. Count A counts everything. 
and you'll see that there is 3000 houses like I mentioned. Um, and. And then that will give you that number. Then what we want to now find out is how many suburbs. If you just say count A of Melb suburb, you're going to get again 3000 saying that there are 3000 suburbs, but that's not true. Uh, for example, you can clearly see. Uh, Br Brunswick here is already repeated once and then it's going to repeat multiple times like each suburb would have multiple houses, so that's not the correct one. If you look at the filter, you can see that there is not 3000 items. There's probably 70 or 80 items here. So what we want is before we count, we need to take out any repetitions and then count. So we can do all of that here, but I'm just going to add a new tab. This way you can see things clearly uh, and. Uh, and then here in this tab. How many suburbs? So we want the number here. I'm just going to print some color there. If we can actually see all the different suburbs, then we can count them. So distinct suburbs or. They take out any duplications and just show me one row per suburb. And this is where in Excel. Uh, one thing that I kind of forgot to mention, but uh, most people would have guessed by now is the version of Excel that I'm using. I'm using Excel 365. Uh, but if you are using like a Excel 2010 or 2016 or 2019 or some other version, you may find a different set of formulas. I use 365. I have been using it for the last three years now, so. It's kind of become natural for me to just work with 365 all the time. Uh, if you are using a different version, the formula that I'm going to show you is not going to work, but don't worry, we will pick up another way of doing this later on. So to do the distinct suburb, you can use the unique function. So unique of Melbourne suburb. What this will do is it will tell you how many different suburbs are there, all the names of them. So if you hit enter, you'll get a list of values. You can see that this is not 3000. 3, it's about actually 276. So now. Uh, I just need to count how many unique records are there. So here we can ask that question directly saying count a unique. Melbourne suburb. So you can pass on that result of unique to count a directly and then it will tell you there are 276. That seems a little bit too high if you ask me, but. Uh, we're going to go with that for now. There as part of your exploratory analysis is not just taking what you find, but also kind of raising an eyebrow at things that you are seeing and then saying, huh, that looks a little bit weird. Let me go and investigate that a bit more. So that is the intention of EDA. EDA is not to just calculate totals or averages or things. It is to suspect the data from time to time. And then ask more poking questions like, oh, th this doesn't feel all right. Let me go check a little bit more. For example, if you were to feel like 276 seems like a bit too many suburbs for a city, what you could do is you could kind of go and check whether this is correct or whether there is something funny going on in the data. For example, these are my distinct suburbs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my unique and then pass it on to sort function so we can see the results in the sort order. So this is how they look like. And essentially what I'm looking for is. Any. Duplication, so sometimes what happens is when you get the data. You might have an extra space. So Brooklyn and Brooklyn with an extra space at the end might look like two different records for Excel, but they're same thing. So there might be some data errors that might increase this. Uh, it doesn't look like so. But again, this could be like an investigation worth doing. OK, that that's uh, how many suburbs. Likewise. Uh, you can you can check the price, so price would be something that we are going to spend a little bit more time investigating further on, so it's a good idea to do a little bit of exploration on that. So for example, uh, what does the price ranges look like? 
you can use the filter to do this quick quick trick it goes from 145000 all the way up to 8 million dollars that's really pricey houses there and a real wide range going on so one way to deal with this is before we apply any any formulas or anything is it might be a good idea to format it correctly so we can read this information like price so you can select an entire table column by placing the cursor on the header when it turns into black down arrow hit click on that it's going to pick up that entire column and then you can apply the currency formatting using either that button there or changing the format from here or my favorite thing is pressing the shortcut control dollar so control shift four that's going to apply the formatting and if you don't want the decimal points you can take them out and you'll have your currency formatting laid out nicely what this means is you can kind of quickly see some of the costlier listings because they'll have seven digits versus six digits for the others in a visual way but also your filters will now no look a little bit more interesting another thing that i normally do especially when i have got data points where i'm having values from 150000 up to 8 million or 10 to 5 billion or something like that is just to check uh, is the 8 million like an one off case or it's happening more often kind of a thing so to do this what i do is I select my price column and then this is the exploration part. So we don't have any specific goal. We are just trying to poke holes and see how this thing is. So you select the column and then I go to home, conditional formatting, color scale, and I put a color scale on the data. So I usually go with one of these two colored scales rather than three colored ones. So either white to red or white to green kind of a thing. Uh, let's go with the uh, the this option here in so in fact uh, i want to go with that one there so what that is doing is the more costlier a house is the greener that cells color would be okay so this is going to color that entire thing in like that and you can kind of uh, see what is happening like how much green is there essentially we are looking for some sort of a uh, not too unusual color spread. And then when you have lots of data, it's harder to get that bird's eye view. So I also like to take this and now zoom down the spreadsheet. You can use the zoom controls here. Alternatively, you can use mouse pointer and kind of do it like this. Um, because the table colors are also there, sometimes it's harder to spot the green color. But it is there. You can kind of make out when you when you go here and you can kind of quickly see oh there's like some big numbers there um, and this is one way to quickly spot if there is some any weird outliers in the data or not again this data is already coming from a respectable source so i'm not gonna do too much investigation into that side of things but that is worth checking through conditional formatting like that uh, another option is you can also select the price column and go to insert and insert a quick statistic chart. So you're not inserting a regular chart. If you go to insert, you're not inserting a bar chart or a column chart. You're going for this option here. It's called statistic chart. There are a couple of different options. I'm gonna try and look at a histogram. Histogram will give you distribution of prices. Uh, ideally, you're looking for like more houses in the mid of the market and fewer houses on either spectrum, like a normal distribution. So that is kind of like normal. Uh, it, a lot of houses are between 400,000 to about uh, 800,000 and then kind of goes down. There is a long tail. Uh, that kind of keeps on going. So probably very few houses, like one or two in the 6 million, 5 million range, uh, but a lot of them and a very few houses on this end of the spectrum. So a histogram will tell you how the data shape is very quickly. 
And you can tweak these things like the size of the buckets and all of that, but that's not necessary. We are not really working towards any specific goal of analysis now. We're just exploring. So using all of these techniques, you will be able to quickly explore the data. At the bare minimum, I suggest doing this for all the number columns and all the important text columns uh, before you move on to anything specific, because then only you will be able to uncover some problems and issues with your data. So I would check my date, distance, uh, probably not postcode, even though it is a number, it's not really a number. Number of bedrooms, land size, uh, like if the land size is ridiculously large, like 76,000 square meters of land, that looks a little bit off to me. So if I'm doing some analysis based on the kind of like I want to explore land size versus cost, I would probably exclude some of these very high values because they might skew things and they probably don't happen so much in the data anyway. Um, so th those are the things that you want to know. So you want to explore that, get to some sense of what is happening, uh, and then if needed, uh, either reduce the importance of that or take them out of analysis. All right, uh, so that is our first thing, doing a little bit of quick exploration. And now comes the fun part, which is asking some questions. So. Uh, the first question that I wanted to answer is which suburbs have the costliest houses? Okay. There's like 276 suburbs now. And I want to know out of all of these, where are the most costliest houses? There are different ways to answer these kind of question. It, it is not clearly open-ended, but also there is no one right way to solve this kind of a problem. So we are going to try uh, at least two different ways of looking at this. But keep in mind that whatever I show, there might be some other ways to solve it, depending on how you, you view the data or how your audience will usually like to see the answers for these kind of things. So the, the technique that I normally use for this kind of things is I start out by making a pivot table rather than building formulas because that will be more flexible. We can quickly change the layout if we change our mind and whatnot. So we already have the data. We just go to insert and click on the pivot table. Uh, if you do not have it in a table format, you may want to set this in the table because that will let you build and manage pivot tables a lot easier further down and then click on the pivot table um, and uh, just tap OK. This is going to add a new worksheet and build you that. I'm not going to go into the detail of how to build the pivot tables and all of that. That is like a separate thing altogether. Instead, I'm just assuming you have either seen or used a pivot table before in your life. If not, uh, again, stay tuned for what I'm going to talk at the end because the Excel school program is going to certainly give you all of that necessary background in order to really use these kind of things in a seamless and powerful way. So we got the pivot table. Uh, it will set a layout here and you have got the fields here. We are going to take the suburb and put it into the rows area. So all the 276 suburbs will end up here. You can see that. And for each suburb, I want to now see like one way to answer these kind of questions is which suburbs have the costliest houses? If the suburb house prices are, let's just say we are going to go for something very naive. If we average all the house prices in that suburb, and then which suburb, whichever suburbs have higher average, we can kind of say on average within that suburb, the price of house would be higher. That's one one way of looking at it. I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but this is one simple way of looking at it. So we take in the price, put it into values. It's going to first add up all the prices. We don't want it to add. So we're going to right click and then summarize this with average. So that is the average price of house in each suburb. And then we're going to number format this in currency with zero decimals. So we can kind of see where the average looks like and right click again, sort this largest to smallest. 
So we're going to get the suburbs that have higher average prices up top. So you can see Canterbury, Malvern, Brighton, all of these places up on the top. And further down, you can kind of see lower prices going, going down. This is one, one simple way of kind of quickly getting what we want, which is build a pivot, put price on average, and then get this. Now, before we kind of jump the gun and then say Canterbury has the most costliest houses or whatever, one simple way to double check that assertion would be at least see how many houses have sold in Canterbury. Like Canterbury might be having 5,000 houses and only one of them is sold. So because this record of data is really sold houses, it's not all the houses in that place. And they might have sold only one house for 2.8 million. So the average of that single sale record would be 2.8 million, which will then kind of falsely indicate that all the costliest houses would be, it had more costliest houses. It may not be the case. It might be like a big fish in a small pond kind of a situation. So a good double check here would be to add a column that kind of tells you how many houses were there in the data. So we can take something like uh, address and put that there. It will count how many addresses are there. So 13 houses have, have been sold in Canterbury and, and the average of those 13 is 2.8 million, which is significantly a big number. So we can kind of see that maybe there are lots of costly houses there. Uh, and then further down Brighton, 46 houses. So now you can see this is like really heavyweight thing. 46 records and the average of all of them is 2.818. So this is also like a worthy candidate for, for that particular question. Uh, further down here, 35, 43. So some of these are good, but some of the others you could probably disregard like Princess Hill, 1.8 million average, but only with two records, right? One of them could be 3 million. The other one would be like 600,000 and they both average out to 1.8 million. So you don't want to trust this kind of a number too much. Uh, but at least we wouldn't know that until we add the number of records as a check. Here is one McKinnon, 1.68 million, but only one house. Right? There is no way we can come to a conclusion just based on a single thing. So this is a good check. You will find such things at the bottom as well. Like, for example, most of these places, Roxbury Park or, uh, you know, all of them, they might actually have a lot of costly houses. It's just that none of them were sold. There is only one house sold for $478,000. So that, that ended up further down. So you don't want to immediately conclude, but at least this gets you halfway, you'll know what is going on, and then you can do further investigation. Another thing that I do want to in kind of quickly investigate is this is for all types of houses, right? We have got houses, uh, townhouses, and units. So everything is included. Likewise, this is for all the house types. Like, for example, naturally, a eight bedroom house would, would have more cost because it's by definition bigger. So we, we are trying to say, uh, we are trying to compare apples and slightly bigger apples and even bigger apples in one chunk. We don't want to do that. We want to isolate this to one type of thing before we come to conclusions. So you may want to, for example, instead of looking at all the houses, just look at three bedroom houses and then see which suburbs have the costliest three bedroom houses, which might give you a little bit more balanced view of the right kind of a thing. So that kind of a thing could be done by taking the bedroom in your pure table field list, right click on it, and you can add it as a filter, but I like to use slicers because they're more fun. So right click on the bedroom thing, add as a slicer. This will give you a slicer which has buttons for all the possible number of bedrooms. So you have got zero bedrooms to nine bedrooms. 
I wonder what is a zero bedroom house look like. It's probably just like a one room studio kind of a thing. And then I'm going to select three here. And then let's see the magic. When you pick three. Again, the pivot table gets changed. All the re averages get calculated. Addresses counts get updated. And here is the fun part. The sort gets reapplied. So now for three bedroom houses, Malvern is the highest average price of 2.8 million. So this is like really pricey. I mean, if you look at all the houses, Canterbury has 2.8 million. But if I look at just three bedroom, Malvern has 2.8 million for three bedrooms alone. So something really interesting. Uh, and then respectable number of houses too, five, five houses. So it's not like one house. Uh, Clayton, we can probably ignore that. Uh, this one you can ignore, but you can see further down here, Brighton, 1.9 million and 19 houses. So definitely some really costly houses there. Only three bedroom. And you can do the same for four bedrooms or eight bedrooms if you really fancy. There is only one house with that criteria. Nine, obviously you'll find that further down. There are fewer of them, but one bedroom houses or two bedroom or three bedroom and then quickly do that. Likewise, it doesn't have to be a single slicer. You can bring in something else also, like maybe um, house type. So if I'm interested to know which suburbs have the costliest three bedroom houses, not townhouses or units, so I'll select those two. I can see Malvin still holds. So this is a really, uh, solid indication that they do have some very costly three bedroom houses uh, and yeah probably this is where you could then go and look at the data a little bit more come to conclusions okay so i'll we can again kind of go more in depth into this but i think that should give you a sense of how you can go about answering that kind of a question using the tools that you have at your disposal, the pivot tables and slicers and in the data set that you have. You can also use formulas to do this, but the formula way would be not harder, but at least different. And unless you are experienced and conf confident with formulas, you might struggle a lot to get to the same kind of numbers with formulas. Whereas pivot tables, it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes to build what I showed you. Let's say we'll go at a little, little bit more of inquiry mode of data. If I have got $800,000 and I want to buy either a three bedroom or a four bedroom house, where should I buy? Which suburb I should start exploring? So let's put ourselves into the shoe of a house buyer and then go and explore the data. I'll show you again a uh, couple of ways to do this. But as we are also a little bit hard pressed on the time, I want to uh, kind of lean on to the easier ones. So the easiest way to do this is you can go to the data, apply filters. If the filters are already there, that's good. But if they're not there, uh, you can select any cell here and then from the home, sort and filter and apply the filter area. In fact, the filtering thing is something that I do every day, many, many times that I know the shortcut. In if you point your mouse, you can see the shortcut showed on the screen. What happened to that? Somehow when I zoom in, it goes off. But the shortcut is Control Shift L. L for Larry. So Control Shift L. If you press once, the filters come on. Control Shift L again, they go off. Same shortcut for both things. So highly recommended that you memorize this control shift L. And then we got 800,000. Now when you are buying something like, uh, let's say you go to the vegetable market and you want to buy mangoes. Um, and you want to buy mangoes for exactly 100, 100 rupees or $100 or whatever. It's highly unlikely that you will find exact exactly right number of mangoes if you if you if you're set on spending only that much money right 
you might be able to find six mangoes cost 90 rupees and then you are left with 10 more rupees. You don't know what to do with that because each one is 15 rupees. Or if you squeeze another five more rupees, 105, you might get seven mangoes. So same thing with houses. Even though when someone says 800,000, they're not really set on 800,000. There is a little bit of wiggle room on either side. So you want to look for houses in the band rather than just exactly 800,000. So let's say when you have 800,000, naturally you have 700,000, you also have 600,000, 750,000. But let's say we don't want to leave money on the table. So we're going to spend anywhere from 750,000 to 820,000. So that 70,000 range is what we are looking for. So we can go here to the price, uh, number filters between, and then say, I want to go from 750,000 to 820,000. It's going to filter down. So 245. Whenever you apply a filter, it's a good practice to. No, get it wrong again. It's a good practice to look at your status bar. It's going to tell you how many records it has filtered. So 245 here that thing that kind of give, immediately gives you a sense of what volume of data is available for that criteria. Now, this is not the only thing. We are also not interested in buying nine bedroom houses. We want to look at three bedroom or four bedrooms. So we'll go to the bedroom here, uncheck everything and just select three and four. That brings down to 170. And we are not interested in units or townhouses, just the houses. So we're going to go here look at uh, sorry houses and that's going to bring that down to 131. at this point we have kind of narrowed down or focused to just the houses that meet the criteria and then you can now eyeball the suburb list there is still a lot of them to to see where you can buy this is one quick way to do it using the filters you can quickly get and then see that Unfortunately, there is no one or two, three answers. We have got quite a bit of them, so we may need to do a little bit more further investigation to solve this thing. So this is one way, but if you want to build a little bit more flexibility into all of this, then I suggest building this kind of a thing with a formula also, because then it will give you a little bit more kind of flexible way of dealing with this. So I'm going to undo all the filters and this is where again the control shift L is quite helpful because if you don't want to filter the data you want to go back you can press control shift L again this is going to turn off the filters and then take out the uh, bring you back to the full data and then we'll add a new tab I'm going to call this as Q3 and here price start is 750,000, price end is 820,000, bedrooms is, let's just stick with three for now, we'll later on we can change this, type is H. Okay, so we got all of this, and then what we want to see is, Suburb average price number sold. So it's kind of like what we did earlier, but for each suburb, then we just want to see what is the average price there and how many houses have been sold within that bracket. Uh, if there are just one house sold, then we probably don't have a chance to find that next house in that suburb. But if there's lots of houses sold within that price band, that can kind of give us a confidence that if we look there, then we might find a house. So this is what we want to generate. You could create a pivot table like this, but I'm going to show you quickly through formulas how we can kind of come up with this. Mm, it might be a little bit confusing or long, so I'll see how far we can go. If, if it feels too laborious, then I'm just going to give up halfway uh, and leave it all for you to figure out as homework. So we first want to extract the criteria that meets all of this here, all the houses that meet that. So we can say filter 
Filter is a new function in Excel 365 that can filter the data based on the criteria you mentioned. So we are going to say filter Melbourne, just get everything. The criteria would be it's multifold, like price has to start here, end there, number of bedrooms has to be this, and type has to be this. So four criteria need to be there. And you can build this out using uh, brackets like that. So Melb price is greater than or equal to this number. And then it also needs to be price is less than or equal to that number. So these two conditions will give you the 240 odd houses that we initially found. And then Melb bedrooms is equal to this. Melb type is equal to this. So when you do this, you're going to get the going to count to the 92 yeah, because we are only looking at three bedrooms, not three and four. So 92 sub 92 records that meet that criteria. And then what we want is we want to see all the suburbs in this subset here. What was the average of that column? And how many records are there here? So that means I just need the unique out of this column. Can say unique, and then we just want the unique of the first column of this range. Now we can kind of select it like this. We can say select this entire range like that. So it will say H2 to H93. But the problem with this would be if I change the criteria now and I put four bedroom, I might get a different set of records. There might be 300 houses with four bedrooms but it will stop at 93. So this, this thing is not enough. So what we need is we need another way to get here. So we, we are going to say unique of H2 hash, which will pick up that entire spill range, but we don't want to take all of these columns. We just want to focus on the first column. So this is where Excel now has lots of cool new functions. So uh, choose columns is one of those functions. I like to use this. Choose columns of H2 hash one means take the entire range that is there and then just get the first column of that and then get me the unique records out of that. While we are here, we are going to sort this by alphabetical order. So it will list you all the suburbs. There are about 53 suburbs that have that are appearing in this data. And then what we want is we want to average the price of each of these suburbs by looking at the price column there. So here we can again say um, average. Um, you might think that will work, but I feel like that is not going to work. So we're going to have to have do this like this. This is where I said the formulas might get a little bit confusing in the end, uh, unless you're more comfortable with them. But we are going to try. So average of we want to average that column, but not every record, just the records that are in Airport West. So if we can filter down this list just to Airport West, then we can average that. So we'll say filter choose columns of H2 hash that picks up that entire thing. And then we want the average, which will be, you can see here, so that's column number one, two, three, four. So fourth column is what we are interested in. So choose filter the fourth column of H2 based on choose columns H2 hash. First column is equal to here. So if I just do it like this, uh, I'll get the two records that appeared in Airport West. We don't want to see the records. We want to average them. So we can just say average of those guys. It will give you that number. And when you fill this down, uh, you're going to get errors because the spill range moves. So because we're not locked it, it's H3, H4 like that. But H3 doesn't have a spill range. It has to be H2. 
So this is where you need to lock this using that kind of annotation dollar h dollar two. And then when you do that, we're going to get the average prices. We're going to use the same thing. But instead of averaging, we're going to count that. And uh, now you have got a good sense of where things are. Obviously, with such a restrictive criteria, not many records are going to be there. But even with that, you can see something like Glenroy has six records or something like Pasco Vale has five. So those are probably a good suburbs to start looking because there is sufficient information that things have been sold multiple times with that. So you might have better chance of finding that house in those places rather than Albion where there is only one house within that price range sold in the last whatever amount of data you have available. You may not have much chance of finding. Now, because it's all dynamic, if you were to extend your logic now, like you know, you change this to four, you will find different information. Likewise, if we go back to three, but then look at all the units, you will find some errors will come because of the way we have set it up. Uh, but you you can fix those problems by readjusting the formula. So that is a little bit more. Again, uh, if you have not used filter formulas much, you can learn a little bit more. Uh, there are lots of places where you can learn, uh, but I'm not going to go into individual bits and explain because that will just take its own sweet little time. So that's question number three. We'll go back here. Let's quickly check what else is remaining. So these two are remaining. Um, I feel like it will not be fun if I just keep you here for more than the promised time. So I'm going to quickly attempt this and then that's where I'll stop. But feel free to take that up as a, a homework problem and try to solve it using the data that I provided you. It's a very good exercise to quickly self learn and improve your your analysis skills if you want to. You know, do that. So one thing that I want to kind of check is we have got the distance to CBD here. How far away from the center of Melbourne these houses are. And then I wanted to know. Is the price really coming down the farther I am away from the city? Normally that is what common sense tells me uh, like, you know, if I if I'm living in a big metropolitan like Hyderabad and the more I move away from the center of the city, the cheaper it would get for me to buy a house. That that is what common sense would tell you. I just wanted to double check whether that is holding true with the data set that we have here. So we know the distance, we know the price. We are just going to play. Uh, I'll put few uh, four here. And uh, the easiest thing to do would be, even without adding the sheet here, is select the distance column, uh, tap on the header, it will select the column. Pull down control and select the price column. So both columns are selected. And then if you go to insert and make a XY plot. You'll get a plot like this. Uh, I want to try it out the other way around. So select the price and then select the distance. And then go and insert. It doesn't matter which way you go. I think somehow it seems to be set on laying this out like this. Uh, so essentially what we have here is the price is on the X axis and the distance is on the Y axis. And uh, and we can kind of see. The farther you go. Ideally, what we were expecting is uh, the farther we go, the price kind of should be kind of slowly moving towards the less thing. But because we've got lots of records like noisy ones, so of if I look at all of these. Uh, so all of these are like kind of noise, like one off records where you're selling a house for 9 million, you know, that doesn't really count. Um, so if I can take out all of this, like let's just say we limit that analysis to some of the. More, 
like not the costliest one. So maybe anything more than 2.5 million if I take out, then we might start to see some something emerge. Again, it may or may not be true because uh, there is like all sorts of information. Uh, so at least this will give you a sense of what is happening. And uh, I'm going to cut this control X. Go to here, paste this guy here, and then make sure I'm saving because the previous times in live streams when I tried this, sometimes Excel would crash uh, and uh, you know we lose some work. So fingers crossed that's not going to happen. So one of the cool things that people don't realize is when you have a chart that comes from your data, the chart can be interacted by simply filtering the data. So if you if you now go here and filter this data, so let's just say I'm only interested in houses for this analysis. So if I go here and select H, click OK. If I go here, now some dots disappear. You see all of these dots have gone. Those are houses. So this is a powerful way to visually explore your data by filtering it and taking out the data points that are not relevant. And then what we also want to do is maybe limit the analysis to anything under five bedrooms. So more than five bedrooms, I feel like they are like really out there. So we don't need to look at that. Uh, again, some more dots have gone off. And then any price less than, let's just say 2.5 million. So now some of that noise is gone, but it kind of also is meaningless, but at least now you can kind of see what is happening. Okay. Uh, and if I expand this out, obviously there is no clear indication that the, the farther you are, the cheaper it is. Because uh, for example, some of the cheapest houses are actually closer to the city, like 307,000 here, than the farther to the city, they're, they're always 410,000. But at least you can see what is happening. Like you can kind of see a little bit of trend emerge here. Although nothing solid, at least you can see what is happening there. Like there is a, some of these might be houses that have problems or issues and that's why they're getting sold. We are assuming everything is like good quality Apple here, but a bad Apple will always be sold even though it is like a highest type of Apple, like a really usually sells for a lot of money, but if it is rotten, then people are going to give it for throwaway price. So that could be the case for some of these houses, but we are assuming all the houses are equal, but that's not the case. So if you kind of ignore these dots and look at that, you might see a little bit of a ridge on this side. Again, probably just noise, uh, but also at least tells you the houses closer here are 800,000, but further down here, they might be 400,000. So this is one way to look at it. I wouldn't really come to super hard conclusions from this, uh, but at least it is a fun way to explore and then see. What we can kind of clearly see is uh, there is a lot of noise. So that usual saying that the farther you get away from the CBD, the cheaper it might get is probably not through all the time, because this is what the data says. The data says uh, you can find a costlier house anywhere, uh, but the chances of you finding more costlier houses are closer to the CPD. So if I'm looking at these higher priced houses and then saying, where are they? A majority of them are here, which are closer to the CPD. I don't have any costly houses up there. There is one exception here, uh, but normally, most of the costly houses are closer to the CBD. Whereas we also have a lot of cheaper houses closer to the CBD and not very far. This could simply also be because a lot, lot more people live closer to the city and hence there are more houses there and hence more are getting sold. Whereas further out, like 50 kilometers away from Melbourne CBD, there might be a lot of farms and rural areas uh, and fewer people living, fewer houses available and built, and hence fewer sold, and that could also be the reason. But at least you can kind of see what that is happening by looking at that picture. So that is how you can 
do the analysis in Excel. I'm not going to get into the fifth one, but you can try it out. We do have a nicely formatted date here. Uh, look at it, look at it and you know, test it out with pivots or formulas or charts and have fun. I hope you enjoyed the main main part of our performance and uh, you know had fun learning many things. I did say five things, but I believe we covered many, many more ideas and concepts, shortcuts and formulas and techniques and everything. Uh, although we only explored four themes, I'm really happy with where we are. So now that we have kind of completed the main part, I'm just going to briefly explain what to do, what else to learn. Um, if you are kind of thinking, oh, there is a lot to know, what should I focus on? My suggestion is at least learn how to work with tables, a little bit on how to use Power Query, and then learn the important formulas and pivot tables as the two ways to analyze the data and then understand how to use the various charts, conditional formats to combine that information. So that is like, it doesn't cover everything in Excel, but it should cover a majority of what you will do when you are working within Excel. There might be a lot of other odd things like uh, what would an equation do, but there is no value in learning those things. So focus on these big items first and learn and work with them. And when you are working, you're not really trying to see how to use pivot table alone or how to use conditional format alone, but you're also thinking, how do I take pivot table, combine it with my formulas to get the result? Or how do I take my formula, combine it with the chart to get a specific result? So you're trying to not just see these as individual tools like a hammer and a screwdriver, rather than you're thinking, how do I use these three tools together to build a piece of furniture? So that, that's uh, where that synthesis and that collaboration between these ideas comes into picture. And this is the reason why I find that sometimes when people focus on learning Excel, they might get a little bit too theoretical and try to learn individual things rather than try to think the big picture and kind of weaving a something more well with all of these things together. So that's why I prepared Excel school program because I never had something like this when I learned and figured things out in Excel and I wanted to have something like this so that a data analyst or a business analyst or a project person or anybody who's using Excel every day has got that resource to fall back on and learn in a more methodical way. So check out the Excel school program. I will put a link to this in the chat. I'll send a link to this in the email with the other stuff as well. But check it out. It is a tested program that has been running for the last 10 plus years with different versions of Excel. And, uh, you know, it will give you that confidence to work across various aspects of Excel in a more confident and comfortable manner. You can see what is covered here, uh, but essentially we are going to do all these four things, which is working with data through Power Query, tables, relationships, how to use references, how to clean up data, how to analyze the data through formulas, pivots, advanced formulas, and doing ad hoc analysis, how to make outputs through various things, and how to build beautiful, powerful reports with interactivity, navigation, and you know all of those awesome things. Uh, you can check some examples of what you will learn, some of which is similar to what we did, but a lot more polished. Um, and a little bit more detailed coverage. Uh, it, there is like basic program and an optional module on dashboards. Um, especially if you need to do a lot more business reporting, I recommend looking at the dashboard option as well. You can see the example dashboards uh, and uh, you know kind of things that you will learn in the program. The course is available on the page. Uh, two options and you can pay in dollars or rupees. The price will be slightly discounted if you are purchasing in rupees. So feel free to check that out and give it a try. Um, if you're like feeling I need something, I don't want to waste months and years trying to go through YouTube and websites and figuring out the correct way and order to learn and unlearn and all of that, then this one program will definitely guide you. Uh, but Alternatively, you know, you can also use the files and examples like this and other free resources. So if you don't want to pay or you don't 
have resources or time to invest into something like this. That is all cool. Learn from the resources like this. Whichever way you do, I wish you all the very best and I hope you succeed and I hope you get uh, something meaningful out of your data through tools like Excel. But more importantly, you know, you get to free your time so that you get to do other awesome things rather than being stuck in Excel all the time.